Hank, what will we be talking about today? Okay, good morning. Um, good to see everybody this Friday morning. And before we start, I have one quick thing I want to mention is one of the things I look forward to on Slow Art Fridays, besides seeing you all and talking about art, is the music selection. And there are a couple of docents, Steve Bennett and Kathy Zeguin, that that's part of what they do for us is they look at the Slow Art Friday and they choose the best music. So if you see any of them on a Slow Art Friday or other tour, be sure to thank them for the great job they do. Like I have I said, to admit, I was <laughs> dancing today and singing along to the music before I turned on my video. So I think that's what put me in that really silly mood. Exactly. They do a great job. So today, as Christy mentioned, we're going to look at three artworks from the current exhibit, Meeting the Moon. I thought it would be nice now that the pandemic has been with us for a year and things are starting to ease up just slightly, and some folks feel a little bit safer traveling, that we might travel. But to keep it safe, we're going to leave the Earth and, and travel to the moon. Um, and the, the, um, the rationale behind the Meeting the Moon exhibit is this year, 2021, marks the 60th anniversary of the beginning of the Apollo space program um, with NASA. Prior to that, of course, artists for decades, since the beginning of time, have looked at the moon and used the moon in artworks. And there's always been a mystery around the moon. Once we did land on the moon, you could see it close up and many of us on our television sets. It, it retained some of that mystery, but it also lost a bit of that mystery. So we had a nice balance. And these um, works in the meeting, the moon, are works that were inspired by that um, 1969 expedition to the moon. I mean, it was in the May 25th of 1961 that President Kennedy um, actually in a joint address to Congress said he wanted to send man to the moon in return. So actually that's gonna be 60 years next month that the president set that goal for us. So as you all know, um, we will look at an artwork for a few seconds and then I'll ask you some questions and we'll talk about it. So with that said, I've got a little quick video that we're gonna kind of look at to put us in the mood. So Christy, if you could go ahead and start the video. Would you like to live on the moon? Yes, I would. You would? You'd like to be one of the first people to go? Yes. We have one of the most challenging assignments that has ever been given to modern man. The United States Man and Space Program is at least eight months behind that of the Soviet Union. Now it is time to take longer strides. Time for this nation to take a clearly leading role in space achievement. It's there. We'd be neglecting our duties as people if we didn't try to investigate it. Oh, my God, look at that picture over there. There's the Earth coming up. Wow, that's pretty. You well may be the first man on the moon. How do you personally feel about it? Well, I have the same desires as all the astronauts. We'd all like to make that trip. They should be within five miles of their landing point. How's our margin looking, Bob? They're going in. Picking up some dust. Tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. We copy you down, Eagle. We got more of a problem. Okay, stand by 13. We're looking at it. It's a stepping stone to deeper space. It is no longer a dream, but a reality. Welcome to the moon. We leave as we came with peace and hope for all mankind.
All right, let's go ahead and talk about this piece. What's going on in this artwork? Well, it looks like blown glass with, um, you know, multiple colors. And uh, since we're talking about the moon, I I'm going to assume that that's depicting the moon there in the middle with uh, the other colors swirling around it. And uh, there's just one comment I wanted to make about the video real quick is there's two little children watching it in front of that TV. We're like, today we've got computers and iPads and cell phones and live streaming. And back then in 69, you'd be there in front of that uh, antenna TV watching uh, the moon, kind of interesting. So. so there is a very lunar quality to the image on this, on this um, vase. And as you said, the colors, um, uh, interesting, the, uh, the colors are very reminiscent of that little family group that we saw in the video. And that was not intentional. So very good, very good observation there. Um, anybody else? Do I see the space capsule in the center of that moon, a little image? Are you talking about there or at the bottom? No, right where you went. A, kind of a ghost image. Of, and the, the tall figure above that. So in that sort of yellowy looking mm -hmm. area. It could be, could be very good. Anybody else see anything in there? Well, I, I, what I see is it looks like actually a horizon and then the moon over it and then different levels, levels of sky, uh, atmosphere is what I guess I would call it. Uh, and it's interesting that it's in this shape. Uh, it looks more ceramic than glass to me, but either way, it's... Uh, the darkness of the opening of the vase uh, provides a whole different uh, appearance to it. It's a black hole. So what do you think? Say more about that darkness. What do you think that, what do you, what might you say about that darkness at the opening? I'm I'm sorry, Hank. What I didn't get your question. So it, I, I was kind of caught by your comment about the darkness at the top at the opening of the of the artwork. Um, can you say more about that? What do you think that might might be significant of, or what does it make you think of? Or well, it makes me think of a black hole, but it makes me also think of the uh, unknown parts of space. I mean, we look up into the sky anytime that the sun isn't shining, we see darkness and uh so it's and that represents to me all of the unknown so that black interior could possibly be all the unknowns that are the unknowns of space right so yes i can see that good good what else do we see i'm really struck by all the layers in the piece the swirling sky up above near the opening and the centerpiece itself. And to the left, the blue and green swirling cloud-like image. And then down below, just the layers of the moon or a planet. And I mean, so many layers. And in the middle of all those layers, there's a bluish um, section that's intriguing to me as well. So I love the layers as well. In that bluish section, yeah, is that white where Christie's got the um, the cursor pointing? No, that looks more like landscape to me. But down okay. below, between all the layers, there's a section that looks watery to me, like ocean. Farther ocean. down. I agree. And I'm trying to sort of figure out in my mind where I am and what I'm looking at and how I'm seeing the moon because I agree um you know just as Sandy said I sort of jumped to this um circular shape here being the moon and 
there's, you know, craters on the moon that could account for some of the variation of um, the surface and also, you know, this green spot here. But I guess at first I was thinking that maybe I was supposed to be on the moon and maybe I'm looking out at another planet or planetary body. But, um, you know, as we saw in that video, if you were on the moon, it's basically like a white surface sort of surrounded by this deep, rich black of space, you know, without a, an atmosphere. So it then makes me think that I must be somewhere on Earth looking at the moon. Um, and, you know, during some sort of really beautiful time of day, like sunset or sunrise to account for that pink um, sky and sort of the, the swirls of the blue and the maybe the reflection of that sky on, as Micah said, maybe a body of water or something. I too thought maybe it was different representations of what you might see from the moon or alternately that maybe that pink part to the right and below the, the, the spot, the circle in the center has crater type white things in it that maybe that is also representative of the moon. And so it's kind of interesting. It, 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 where are you looking exactly, Laurel, for the crater? Um, what you describe as a crater like? Go to the right, where, yeah, there, like, okay. yeah, yeah, in that area there. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. Perhaps, you know, it, it's hard to say. Uh, I would be curious too. I don't know if anyone's seen it in person, what the reverse side looks like, because this is a three dimensional vase, correct? I mean, right. Yeah. So is there another moon and another uh, water like replicated on the other side? That would, I'd be interested in that. If y'all want to keep talking, I can go pop out and look. Okay. I don't have another image, but oh. Oh. <laughs> it's right outside my office. Oh, look. Go do it. OK, you talk amongst yourselves. We, I'll be right back. We will carry on. So um, Sandy just raised a good question in the chat, would surrealism um, be a label we could apply here? And um, what do you all think? The reason I thought of that is possibly the upper swirl. Uh, I know there's no wind on the moon. And so that, that just is a dreamlike quality to me, though it's not realistic. Well, it, it, you know, you raise a good point there because one of the things that that changed in 1969 is what we knew about the moon. You know, prior to Man on the Moon, we didn't know nearly as much as we did after Man Land on the Moon. We got, I think I read, 800 pounds of, of samples that were brought back to Earth for scientific studies. So we learned a lot. But if we look at this vase, you think this... Does or does not represent any increased knowledge in the moon after 1969. You know, I, I, what made me think of that was that Laurel's comment about the crater, and that prior to actually being on the moon, you know, we, we had a, some thoughts of what the surface looked like, but I don't know that we knew about craters and the actual moonscape. But here that is represented in a vase that that um, Sandy said she could describe as surreal. Would you like for me to report back? Yes, I saw you sit down. So what would okay. you find out? So on the other side, and I wish I had a picture of it, I tried to take a picture, but there were too many reflections, so it wouldn't have come out well. But uh, on the opposite side, there's another one of these sort of beautiful green and blue cloud shapes. And there is another circle, which you might read as a moon or something, that is sort of partially obscured by the cloud shape. But instead of being this sort of rusty color, it's, all, it's the same sort of greenish blue. Thank you to our scout, Christy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, the more I contemplate what you said, Christy, 
it's the piece is starting to feel very dimensional to me. And I do feel like it's a perspective from earth because the landscape depicted in the vase can't be the moon. Right. Um, me, but the center does seem to be the moon. And I don't know what the very center little contraption is unless it's, um, what is it, Apollo? Um, so it's interesting to think of the moon, this is hard to describe, but within the earth that the connection, maybe that's what it is, the connection between the earth and the moon. Yeah, I don't know if anybody else has Apple TV Plus. It's sort of a new channel that Apple put out, a uh, streaming channel. And they have a show that I'm currently just completely obsessed with called For All Mankind. And it's um, an alternative history. I also really like alternative history shows. Um, and the premise of the show is the Russians reached the moon one month before the Americans in 1969. And what are the ripple effects of that, um, of that event? And one of the most beautiful things I think about that show is the scenes that take place on the moon, which um, as you were saying, Micah, you know, it's, it's super crisp because there isn't sort of the same air quality and water in the air. Um, it's this deep, rich black background and this white, white surface. And so, you know, if I'm thinking about the surface of the moon now, that's what I'm thinking that it would be like, having never been there and probably never going myself. So this would be the antithesis, this sort of beautifully, richly colored swirls, atmospheric, um, you know, what we're seeing on this jar. It just couldn't be that. Also, I highly recommend that show to anyone. All right. So anybody else have any thoughts or see anything? Can you highlight, Christy, the center piece so it's enlarged? Ah. Interesting. I'm curious about the little spider-like image in, at the very center and then the white what do y'all think that is? The white kind of reflective area above it? I have a thought that you might not like. <laughs> um, it could be a reflection <laughs> from the studio lights. Oh. <laughs> um, as wow. I was trying to take a picture of the other side, I couldn't um, because it was behind plexiglass, but also the surface is incredibly reflective. And I wonder if this is a reflection of the umbrella from the studio light here, mm -hmm. but I can't say that for sure because this to me looks like it could be an imperfection in the clay or the um, or the glaze. I'm just not 100% sure. Hmm. Interesting. So let sort of summarize, I think we've um, definitely, I think we all pretty much agree that there's a very much a lunar quality to this piece. And I think most of us see sort of a landscape. You know, I myself see the water and then that little green stripes kind of at the horizon and then the sky with the moon above it, a little green cloud to the left of the moon. As far as what's in the moon, I think we could have some continued discussion about what might be going on inside that little circle. But with that said, Christy, let's move to the next slide. And it's untitled from the Moon Bottle series. The artist is John Lewis. It's blown hot worked glass. And it's actually not a huge piece. It's seven inches by seven inches. So smaller than I thought it was when I looked at the image. And then when I actually saw the museum, I was sort of surprised at, at its size. Um, and as far as the artist goes, John Lewis is an American artist. He was a Berkeley graduate student of architecture, and he was introduced into glass blowing by um, another artist who was the founder of the school's glass program. So Lewis moved into glass, opened a studio in 1969 in Oakland, California, 
and he was actually the first um, hot glass studio in the, in the California Bay Area. And, and in the 60s and 70s, as we see, he was inspired by the exploration of outer space. He created a series of landscape vessels. And the technique where this is hot work glass, and Chris, you mentioned that 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 light area could be a reflection or could be a, an imperfection in the, in the glaze. He actually would fuse glass onto a sphere's form. So he'd say these colors are all created by um, glass that he's, hot glass that he's fused onto this, this vase form. And he moves them around to create this, this landscape kind of effect. And, so that is John Lewis. Any last comments or questions before we move to the next one? I just, I think it's incredibly beautiful. Isn't it? I agree. Yeah. I think it's really interesting that we had a hard time figuring out what it was made of. Usually that's pretty easy just to look at and figure, it out, figure out, but the form I think is something that you see far more often in ceramic, but that surface is just so reflective. All right, Christy, let's go ahead and we'll look at the next one. So what do you all think? What's going on in this artwork? This one's a little perplexing to me. I'm, I'm, I see the colors, the red, white, and blue, and that is patriotic, reminds me of the American flag. But it's hard to tell if it's water, night, day. You've got a blue at the bottom here, which could be a moon, a red up here, which could be the sun, or maybe the opposite. And I'm not sure what the two tall structures are. So it's, um, I don't know if I'm supposed to interpret it to be actually anything or just give a feel of being something. So um, I agree that the, that the red, white, and blue likely are um, representation of, of, you know, the colors of America kind of thing because you know, as, as it was hinted in the film, and as those of us that were around back when this happened, it was very much a, the, the lunar landing was very much a point of national pride. So I agree with you there. Um, as far as what it is, anybody else have any thoughts? But those do look like twin towers, don't they? So they do look like towers, um, and, and if we think about the space program and towers, does anything come to mind? The, the towers that are used for launching is what comes to mind for me. Yep, yeah, and that's that's a good observation. Either the towers are used for launching or the towers that are used for um, assembly. They're both, you know, very tall towers. And, it, and so if we look at this um, image from that perspective, does anybody see anything different? Uh, is that an elevator going up in, in the Central Park? I'm sorry, ask that again? Is that the elevator that takes the astronauts into the um, capsule? It might be. It might be. I I agree with Billy. Um, it made made me think about launch um, at the towers because um, of the sort of uh, white shape here and the billowy blue shape here and the billowy red shape here. What one thing that I'm always struck when seeing, yeah, the, the launches of shuttles or rockets or whatever is this massive amount of sort of fire and smoke and everything that comes out steam at the bottom in order to lift all of that super heavy weight and machinery and fuel to get it even off the ground and continue oh, to descend up to space. I thought a cat was. So, you know, 
that always strikes me. It always seems really like dangerous to be anywhere near it, which is why I guess they launch, you know, from, from an island or the Cape. So just to give you a little bit of information that might help how you look at this and what we might be looking at. Um, the title of this piece is Cape Canaveral. So I think, um, Billy was hit the nail on the head, I think, when she said that this looked like maybe the launch towers. So with, with that thought, any anybody see anything? Well, I just wonder if the uh, orange dot and the blue circumference on the right is um, the moon. <laughs> Keep your eyes on the prize. There's the moon that we're aiming for that that might be the destination right so and i don't see red for some reason i see orange i people talked about red white and blue but i see orange more than i see red and i yeah in person it, i i i would say it's red okay so um and peter in the chat had a comment let me pull that up that looked so red hot magna below the ocean, which is the blue, and um, the launch of the moon, the colors represent the U USA, so very good. I, and I would think the blue could be water because Cape Canaveral is, is on the water. So what else do we see? I'm struck so by then, this little blue guy here. That's what I was gonna say. Well, go ahead, Micah. No, please okay. proceed. Um, <laughs> But, you know, I guess I would have expected if it was meant to be a reflection of the top one that, Micah, you've already pointed out, that it would be sort of directly below it as a mirror image. So it's interesting to me that it's sort of uh, over on this side and doesn't look like it's exactly the same size or scale as the one above which if it were a reflection, I would expect it to be the same size or even slightly larger. So it's, it's just puzzles me. So it, Laurel asked the question, wasn't Cape Canaveral renamed Cape Kennedy? And I think how that works is Cape Canaveral is very specific and it's the actual um, NASA owned property, so to speak. And then Cape Canaveral is a bigger geographic um, descriptor. So, for example, um, the BB&T building is in Asheville. So Cape Kennedy is in Cape Canaveral. Um, so I think that's how they differ. What else can we see here? I'm still just curious about the blue dot and the if that is magma, which is fire, and how it's... Yeah, Chrissy learns um, that and see if we if there's anything there that we're not seeing. The only thing I can think of is if we need to get to the moon, we need fire, which is certainly what magma is. Magma. It is very curious and it's very deliberate, whatever it is. So if we look at this image and, and just look at the whole image or whole computer screen, any, what do you think about that? I think it's interesting too, the, the way the two circles, the, the right red and the bottom blue, if you will, where they're placed. In other words, they're right and left not one above the other or um, left to right. I just think that's interesting. I'm almost wondering with this piece, if you turned it upside down, what that would do. It's a bit interesting that, that you, and that kind of made me think, you see a diagonal relationship between the two circles, you know, rather than being a vertical line between them or horizontal, it's a diagonal line. And if we think about that, in art, a lot of times, what do diagonal lines often are used for? 
Stability. Stability, but also movement. So there's a bit of both there. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I was thinking horizontal. No, diagonals, yes. Diagonals create movement and horizontals create stability. So you have the stability of the red and uh -huh. the trees. And then, see, I agree with Christy that I get a real sense of the fire and explosion that is going on during a launch from the, particularly the white, but the, the diagonal of the white and blue on the left-hand side does give a sense of movement. So, and um, Sandy has a couple comments in the chat. The, the blue could be the core of the earth. And I think that's a very, very valid observation. And also um, earth is the blue planet and then we're leaving Earth to go to the moon, which in the image is the red planet. So it could be we've got both our origin and our destination in the image. So one thing I want to come in on and ask your input on is the way that we're looking at this, if you see we have this printed image on a bigger white background, and that's not because that's how Christy took the picture kind of thing. That's actually very deliberate. That's how the artist um, wants this image displayed um, as far as having the site, which is the actual colored print, and then on the sheet, which is the bigger um, white around that. Any thoughts on that? Do you think the artist was going through a geometric phase or it, the career was about geometry? So I would definitely say there's a geometric phase going on there. <laughs> the, uh, the, the, the white background uh, makes it pop. I mean, the, any, any other color would subdue and, and would influence how you see the red and the blue and, and the white. Think, think of this was on a uh, powder blue wall or a green wall. It would, uh, right, it's on a green wall or a blue wall, would that look different? Or gray, you know, just any beige. It would definitely change mm -hmm. the pop. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, any other thoughts on that? I like the idea of space around it, the white space, because mm -hmm. it's all about space. Um, mm -hmm. And also, I think that the white space at the bottom also sort of helps to give it lift. Um, I didn't even think about the, the term lift off, but if, you know, we read the blue and the red at the bottom as sort of this, um, byproduct of a launch, then it sort of is reflective of that idea of the land or the water around it, um, providing that sense of, um, space because, you know, we always see those, um, launches from afar, you know, um, I think that there's maybe like a beach that's a couple miles away that people can watch the liftoffs, but you have to give this very powerful machinery plenty of space as it travels to space um, because of the nature of the way that we've designed them to be launched. And, and I think that's a good observation because I was thinking along those lines that if you think about the use of white, a big white area in design, like graphic design or art, or even in publishing. And what typically is that referred to, it's called white space. So it's, and that's the term Christy used when she first described this. I think that's very deliberate that the image is displayed on a big white space. And because we have a big void and I think space, even though we know a, a little bit about space, there's still a big void of knowledge out there about space. Also, just thinking about the colors, um, it's just red, white, and blue. It's very simple. There's no other color in here. And it makes me think about um, sort of the extreme patriotism that was um, 
you know, that the United States uh, felt for winning the space race and um, how it brought Americans together um, to all sort of cheer on uh, a big accomplishment. Um, and I think that red, white, and blue are also the colors of NASA, are they not? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Trying to think of their logo, like their mm -hmm. really interesting lettering. But to me, the color choice is very deliberate. It's speaking to, you know, the United States of America and patriotism. And the white definitely makes it very stark and makes the colors really stand out and gives it a strong presence. I, I just had a piece of paper. I had orange and gray here and I just kind of held up orange and gray on either side of it. And it definitely changes um, what you're looking at. So. Well, and to really go out on a limb here, when you look at that big area of white um, as Christy mentioned it, the colors are very deliberate. It's a very patriotic um, theme. And as I mentioned earlier, it was a very much a point of national pride when we landed on the moon, um, because, you know, as you remember, it was called the space race and we were racing against the Russians. And, you know, the Russians were our um, opponents in the so-called Cold War. And if you look at white and you assign a temperature to white, it's cold. So there could be some, some implications there. Any last comments? I think this is a great one to look at. And by the way, this is one of Christy's favorite artworks. Oh. <laughs> right. Let's go ahead and look at the, uh, the next slide, Christy. Wait, Christy, tell me why this is one of your favorites. Well, Hank is about to talk a little bit about why it was created and the series that it was created for. Um, and then I'll answer your question, Sandy. Okay. So, and I'm just gonna read to you what the, the artist's statement, um, the artist is, is Robert Howard Hunter. And it's a little bit long, but it kind of explains his whole uh, mindset. So he says, we live in a world dominated by physical science and technological advancements. Our society has moved toward an electronically enhanced lifestyle, which embraces the form of pragmatic realism. Through our cognitive investigations, scientists and technology has become the image makers of our culture. These images of the universe shape our thinking and action. They threaten to overshadow the broader humanistic character of our American slash European society. So I find myself as a contemporary artist asking many questions about this dynamic and startling culture. These questions, insights, and views are translated into my visual art expression. In recent years, I have continued to make a series of paintings, sculptures, and original prints of space age landscapes and artifacts, mind's eye images of scenes from distant planets. These efforts are produced for the fun of it. Many of them are scenes from the Pacific Northwest. They record our visual environment as one might jot down observations in a journal. So there's, as you can read, there's sort of a rebellion um, or, or acknowledgement or both against how science and technology have changed our worldview. So what were you, what were you gonna add to that, Christy, about why you like it? So I believe that this was part of a series of um, images that Robert Howard Hunter made to celebrate the bicentennial of the country in 1976. And I'm Sandy, I'm a bicentennial baby. <laughs> so um, whenever I see anything from that year, of course I get excited. Um, but I just, I really love sort of the, the real simplicity of shapes and colors and that it not only, um, you know, these very simple lines and shapes show us something um, that resolves in our, in our eyes as far more visually complicated, 
Um, and I love the way at the bottom um, that those sort of organic shapes that they almost look like torn paper, but sort of give that sense of that, as I said, it's always shocking to me to see all of what goes into sort of pushing these big machines up in the air. I also have always really loved these big machines <laughs> that human beings can make in order to accomplish a goal. Um, and, um, you know, these rockets and spaceships are definitely one of them. And then one last comment on the artist, he actually um, is from the Pacific Northwest. He got his Bachelor of Science from Oregon State and his Master of Fine Arts from the University of Oregon. But he also studied at Wofford College in um, Spartanburg and taught architecture at Clemson for 36 years. So, um, so there's a local and uh, Pacific Northwest connection there. Any last comments before we move on? Well, that helps me think about architecture in this piece. Uh, and the emphasis on, on the center is architecture. So I really appreciate the, the background. Thank you. You're very welcome. All right, Christy, I think we could move to the next one. All right, what's going on in this artwork? Well, if you didn't know anything that was related that we're discussing about the moon, you just look at it and it looks like someone scored a piece of wood or took a bite out of a cookie. I mean, that's... <laughs> <laughs> And I think both observations are good. And the first one is more accurate. It, it is a piece of wood. It's not a giant cookie and with a bite taken out. But since we know that we're talking about the moon today, with that in mind, do you, what do you see? I first thought of moon rock, but I guess it's, it's the moon. Well, when you say it's the moon, um, do you think it's the moon as we see it up in the sky, or do you think it's the moon if we were standing on it? Ooh, ooh, I think it's abstract of the moon, but when I see that pie shape, I, I just kind of wonder, is that indicating we're learning about it so we know a small amount about it? So that's the little piece of knowledge we've taken from the moon. Mm -hmm. Could be, very good. What else can we see? I don't oh, know yeah. if this is a phase of the moon that exists. Um, <laughs> just, you know, like you're seeing most of the moon, but with a little chunk out of the, the top. I just have to wonder if that was an existing imperfection in the wood that the artist just incorporated into the finished piece and, instead of trying to eliminate it. I don't know. I mean, it looks like it could be something from the surface of the moon that was collected. I mean, not necessarily a rock, a piece of a crater, uh, just representative of something that was brought back from the moon um, when they walk there. So uh, I, I like that it, it could be an image of the moon or it could be an artifact brought back from the moon. How about the dark side of the moon? Oh, very good, dark side of the moon. What else can we see? Lots, lots of texture. Yes, lots of texture, and, and um, what, if we think about this possibly being a representation of the moon, what might that texture 
say to you? Well, it would be, it's, this is rough and not, um, it, you know, it would, it would be hard to get around. Um, and the more I look at it, I'm appreciating that it, when you look at it at first, it's just kind of a charred piece of wood, but there's a lot of color in it. And so the texture and the variety, there's, there's an, a lot more going on in it than a, you could appreciate at first glance. Mm -hmm. Or that I could. Mm -hmm. So it, it, like I said, the color and the texture is a lot more comp complex than it mm -hmm. appears at first glance. Right. Well, if you think about the surface of the moon, I think it does have a lot of texture because mm -hmm. it's basically hanging around up there, getting beat up by little rocks sort of hurtling through space and other things hitting its surface because it doesn't have the atmosphere like Earth does to burn up some of those things before they get to the surface. So, I mean, it has these craters and pockmarks and... Um, all sorts of evidence of things just sort of hitting it for, I guess, thousands slash millions of years. Um, I'm guessing millions. <laughs> I don't probably know my my universal timeline as well as I should, but um, that it doesn't have its own um, sort of pers pers uh, protective skin, if you will, in the same way that Earth does with, with the atmosphere. I think that might be billions of years. Okay, Mike. <laughs> I need to go back to school. Apparently. I'll do a little research. <laughs> um, but I, I, that's one of the things that I really love about it, because as Billy pointed out, it has a lot of texture, but I feel like a lot of that texture is something that the artist sort of left from the original piece of wood instead of trying to, you know, smooth it and, and make it into something that it's not, it was just, you know, how can the artist um, sort of make best use of the texture that's already there and making it meaningful? So in, that actually uh, kind of prompts a question for all of you. If we compare this to the first two artworks we looked at, um, how is this different? It's different because it's all by itself and it's already being there. It's already the moon. It's like you can feel it or touch it or, I mean, I'm almost expecting like a little man to pop out of the top, like the man in the moon. I don't know. It, it just feels like it, it is the moon. So as Sandy says, you help me think about the protective nature of, of parts of land versus the sand. Very true. And then as Lauren's, Laurel just said, um, it, and I'll kind of paraphrase that in the maybe saying it, it looks more alive. Um, mm. Well, it, it certainly doesn't have the beauty of the first piece mm -hmm. uh, or the, uh, the representational color of the second piece. Uh, but if I think about what I've seen and what for moon rocks and that sort of thing, probably looks more like what the moon would really look like. So the first two images were more represent, less representational. They were polished, they had color, where this is kind of raw and, and possibly what the moon really looks like. The raw and rough word, yeah, raw and rough. Raw and rough, yes. Is it stained this color, or is it the national the natural color of the wood, or as Billy said, is it is it charred? You know, why why is it sort of presenting, at least to my eyes, as black? So the artist, one of the things he would do, what he does with wood, is he lets it dry and crack. So that's part of what we're seeing there. I don't know if it's been charred or not. And when I read up on him in this piece, it did not mention that. So I think it may just be a natural, it's, 
either he found it that way or just from the drying process. And it turned out that way. Or it could be, and I just didn't read it. Um, so Micah has a little bit of information for us. The moon is 4.53 billion years old. So Chrissy, you were correct with the billion. <laughs> um, Sandy says it's blown up. I see much beautiful color and variety like tile. Um, she likes this best after looking at it more closely. So, and I don't disagree with you. I like them all, but this one has a, a very organic quality to me that the others don't have. I think it's rich in color in its own way because there's blacks and browns and grays and just natural tones. So. That's a good comparison to the last two because this does have a lot of natural tones and, and it's in a way more monochromatic, but it's still very complex. So any other comments on this one? Christy, let's go ahead and move to the next slide, if you would. So it's winter moon, charred, varnished, and wax maple. So it is charred. It's right there in the title. I just didn't have that written down. Um, so Billy says, extended looking and hearing the observation of others is my favorite part of Slow Art Fridays. Mine too, definitely. So interesting about this artist, he's actually a, a self-taught artist. He is not formally trained. He actually is a native of Southern California, George Peterson, and he grew up in the skate culture, listening to punk, doing odd jobs, and dropping out of college before teaching himself wood turning. And he didn't consider art as a career. He just liked carving, cutting, and burning wood. And, and that allowed him to, to channel his destructive energy, as he called it, by turning wood into something beautiful. And there was an article I read in WNC Magazine about him. And he's represented by the Blue Spiral Gallery, which is right down the street from the museum. Mm -hmm. And that article, the uh, director of the Blue Spiral says, George Peterson doesn't just sculpt wood through subtractive methods, he attacks the wood, often working with the block green and embracing the cracks as part of a piece's inherent character. His process is gutsy, his work has visceral appeal. And one last thing I want to mention on this artist is he's now uh, moved into repurposing new skateboards. So his wow. art now involves taking skateboards I remember that. and then turning them into different objects. You can see how it's burnished. And we have a beautiful one of those down in the atrium, uh, a spiral. All right. That's anything else before we wrap up for today? Any other comments? All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Thank you, Hank, for leading us uh, in this conversation. Uh, I, as I said, I walk past this exhibition about a million times a day because it's right outside the door of my office. Um, so I'm looking forward, um, you know, I was looking forward to today to learn more about some of the artworks in the exhibition. And uh, next week, uh, our topic is, is it a woman's point of view? Um, our Touring docent Megan Pyle has chosen three artworks by women in our collection, including another work from this exhibition. So there's a, a painting from our collection hall, a, a print from the Meeting the Moon exhibition, and then a really interesting teapot that was recently on view um, in our uh, Carolina Clay exhibition. Um, so don't miss it. Um, I am going to be uh, sending out an eval today after uh, the program so you can give your feedback on today's program. And if you'd like to get registered for next week, that program is on our website as well as all of the Slow Art Fridays in May. We have some great stuff coming up for you guys. So have a look at our website and get registered and we'll look forward to seeing you again soon. I hope everyone has a great weekend. Take care. Bye everyone. Thanks everybody.